Great. Fantastic. It's always so great to come and think things through with you all in the GOGN. And um, yeah, so before we, we start, I want to say Ed Maburak. It's, it's in Australia time, the time for a really amazing end of Ramadan breaking fast. So for um, anyone who is doing that, is here and eating or here instead of eating, like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of am thinking people who watch this recording um, will have, um, so we're thinking of you and the um, amazing time for reflection and good works that happens at this time of year um, through the Ramadan period. So, um, yes, and also um, Joe and I will talk briefly a bit more about who we are, but just to say we've written some really nice papers recently and this is a sort of common ground and um, a lot of what we're bringing to this session and what we're currently thinking about is emerging from this work um, of co-writing papers. So um, open educational practices and a cultural capability unit, learning at the cultural interface, that's open access. Um, there, that work was a great opportunity for Joe and I to come together and bridge our different theoretical backgrounds and for me to read a lot about decolonization from uh, an Indigenous knowledge perspective. So really great to stretch out of my PhD background that's a more of a social justice framing and then to stretch further with that reading about um, decolonization with Joe again and also Taski and Adam in a book chapter that's only just come out. I actually have a feeling it's a 2023 official citation but the preprint came out in 2022 but that work is um, what can decolonization of curriculum tell us about inclusive assessment. So that stuff is is out and about and um, great uh, a great process of um, sharing and stretching ourselves and so yeah at the moment I'm I'm coming to you from Jajawarang unceded country which is northwest of Melbourne and um, at the moment you know chat GPT is is really stretching um, my thinking but not long after I kind of it hit the radar and we had a lot of higher education reaction about assessment change and you know I'm sure we've done lots of reading and there's been lots of interesting publications about you know embedding into higher ed and not panicking or maybe panicking and in any all of that but um, for myself I was thinking well god how can we use chat GPT to create more inclusive learning materials um, and so we'll talk about some of that tonight and um, I'm still experimenting and working and collaborating with people to look at that and um, definitely in my own teaching practice also um, decolonizing assessment conversations is, is a current um, thinking and the recognition of different colonization experiences for I have a lot of international students from Southeast Asia and they have a different colonization um, experiences so so that's definitely on my mind as well like stretching out of the um, solely Australian Indigenous knowledge perspective which has been a really great stretch but then thinking further to well what about everyone else's different knowledge base in um, different colonized spaces so I'm sort of <laughs> stretching from the particular to the global and trying to to think about that um, blending that with feminist pedagogy and finding some interesting overlaps. So um, that's sort of in the stew. But this question about how can we make, uh, how can we use ChatGPT to create more inclusive learning materials is an outcome of a current inquiry experiments across my three different hats. So I'm currently working part time as an equity and inclusion advisor at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, RMIT for short. Still wearing a researcher hat um, as a research fellow with Deakin, where I did my PhD um, at Cradle, the Centre for Research and Assessment in Digital Learning, and now teaching into the Masters of Ed at Monash, um, and so putting into practice um, in that space, which has been, yeah, really exciting. And I'm zooming to you uh, from Larrakia country right here on the top end coast of Australia. I want to acknowledge uh, where I'm coming from, but also 
embed myself in a little bit more um, realistic uh, approach to, to that process and that, that cultural protocol. If it wasn't for a lot of the Indigenous film leadership and supervision and elders sharing uh, their lessons with me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really be, be able to talk to this extent about this type of thing. Um, my learning that I've done here so far has been incredible. So I just wanted to make sure I do that um, respectfully and, and I do that a bit of justice by propagating as much more um, as I can into the into the world that I work in. So I'm a lecturer and researcher in cultural knowledges in digital education, open practices and work integrated learning. Those are kind of my three little dances that I do. Um, I'm teaching pre-service teachers at the moment, but as well doing a capstone unit for graduates and um, across the Bachelor of um, Arts um, set, section of degrees. So um, and study areas. So a lot of a lot of uh, variation there, and um, a lot of my questions that I'm asking now um, is how might we shift power relationships in digital and open platforms to center the student's agency and lived experience with respect to relationships and reconciliation. And that comes from the three R uh, framework um, that the Matt CT um, project put out. That stands for more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander teachers initiative. So um, working a lot with those three kind of um, ideas and how to extend that into a lot of the teaching and research that I'm doing. Thanks, Thanks. Joe. And we're going to have some slides with references. So yes, we will, we will get we will get to that some of those things too. And I think it's important for us as um, white settler ladies to um, not overstep um, and just be clear about where we we see that this works it. So um, it's just a part to play in the work of decolonization. And so I think three things I've been thinking of recently, um, we certainly aim to avoid speaking for Indigenous people, but instead to boost the voice and experience and knowledge of Indigenous people. And we seek to find, use and frame Indigenous authored materials and learn about and cite Indigenous knowledge processes. And so a second aim is to avoid asking Indigenous people to explain things or find things for us. I mean, if you haven't heard that call, wow, it's just everywhere. Um, reconciliation and decolonization is everyone's work and non-Indigenous people need to and can do some of the work of decolonization. And so, yeah, we, we see this as part of the process of doing our part of that work. And, and particular to this event, as I've been running some of these events at RMIT internally, this is the first time I sort of thought to extend that conversation to a bigger group. But yeah, we really keen to learn from that hive mind network of the GOGN and just consider that generative AI is pretty new when we're not presenting ourselves as experts, but um, have some particular groundings and experiences. So definitely this is a two-way learning opportunity. And we'll make some time to break and just if there is extra examples that people could share with us um, I'm really keen to to follow up on those and um, before we share the final PowerPoint happy to insert that into the slide deck too so um, yeah towards the end maybe if you want to put any links or comments in around those things it might be easier for us to collect them up but um, let's see how we go. And before we go further, I actually want to start also by honouring the work of Ali McNini Crothers, who um, very unexpectedly passed away only a few weeks ago. Um, Ali was someone just extraordinary in the um, open education community who um, was just, um, just like a guiding light in so many ways I feel emotional um, talking about it but um, she had also a young daughter she you know did in her personal life inclusive sports um, she was a you know Paralympian had moved into education she did incredible things in her college and this book business writing for everyone was just one of the amazing outputs and um, it um, emerged in the Nash in the sort of um, 
national research study I did into open textbooks and social justice in Australia, this became one of the sort of early examples on how you can integrate Indigenous knowledge, recognise and respect Indigenous voices in a particular way. And um, I still I still remember the aha moment when I read the table of contents and the about pages of her book. And um, I'll just show you the next part here. This is a screenshot for... Um, the about section and she talks about this book takes an inclusive and inductive approach to business communication and sets out some goals for that which is all about the diversity of the student body which is really terrific but this bottom section also says that the book contains narratives by Brenda Fernie who is the president of SAM the economic development branch of the Kwantlen First Nation and I'm like wow, okay, and then continues to talk about how that material can be used. And then when you start to look at the chapters, Brenda's um, experience with running um, a First Nations business and negotiating her role as a businesswoman in that cultural space and interfacing with the non-Indigenous business community and the wider community and the wisdom from that experience, you know, every chapter just about has um, this great story that um, Brenda has in her own words there and it it just I think it was the first time I saw something that wasn't tacked on you know it wasn't like oh we need an indigenous picture <laughs> here or a small indigenous case or you know bung in an ex indigenous example in here and we'll have done the thing it was a really um respectful fully embedded way to do it and subsequent to that it makes you think you know how do you um, as a teacher as a settler as someone in a particular role in an institution approach Brenda you know how does your network al align you know where do you you know what are the steps you make to to enrich your network to to go to places where you can bridge those cultures and and um and ask for collaboration you know the the kind of process that that I've subsequently read about about the time it takes to build trust in those relationships to to want to partner on a, a project like this and and so I guess you know one of the things that Joe and I've been talking about in any conversation about uh, uh, you know taking a role in decolonization of curriculum of education is it's this long slow ongoing process and it goes at the speed of respect it doesn't go to any institutional timeline, deadline. You just can't do it. <laughs> so um, I remember there's this kind of proverb that very annoyingly is kind of called African or Chinese. There seems to be no thing, you know, about if you if you want to go fast, go alone. But if if you want to go far, go together. And I kind of think about that a lot and I certainly thought about it when I um, read about uh, Ali's work. Over to you Joe, and to give us a bit of a run through about some of the, um, the work that you've done before we go and have a look at some of my wacky um, chat GT. Amazing examples, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, your beautiful experiments. Um, when Sarah and I were talking about this presentation, we thought of ways to kind of start from the meta and go to the micro. <laughs> Maybe not in the right word, but anyway, starting. We starting didn't want to get bogged down and give the, <laughs> the West. We didn't want to give the Whitey platform all the space, honestly. <laughs> hey, give you down the back of the bus like everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, some of the projects that I did uh, in the first five years that I lived up uh, here in Darwin and worked for the Northern Institute, we did multiple research projects. And one of them was this uh, called Bowerbird. Um, it was a citizen science platform. And I worked with my Nandi or my mother, um, Kathy Guthajaka, uh, that's that lady there uh, featured in the in most of the, the, the screen captures. Um, she was one of my PhD supervisors. Um, she's just incredible. And uh, so she and I um, populated uh, her kind of page, which is Jurwir, which is the Warmeri and Yongo name for the Bowerbird, which collects all the things. Um, 
And so we populated that with uh, a number of um, images of different um, biodiversity from her homeland on Elko Island or Galawinko in um, Northeast Arnhem Land. And so part of that is um, that makes that kind of a decolonizing is that she just used the fields that she wanted to use. She didn't feel that she had to fill every field that like, you know, um, traditional stories, for example, she didn't feel like that was a that was a sensible thing to do, but she used um, the moiety or the clan relationships to claim digital territory for her knowledge, which um, has taken a lifetime to accumulate and publish in multiple formats elsewhere too. So that's one example that I that was one of the first examples that I was kind of shown about ways to appropriate digital platforms um, and use them in decolonizing ways for um, Indigenous knowledges. Next one. The PreVet project was also a workforce development project that was run by the Federal and Territory um, Department of Education, and it was showcasing Indigenous role models in various um, trade pathways. Um, so as CDU is a dual sector university, so we have higher education and trades, and we wanted to, um, and the, we're the only kind of higher education um, institution in the territory, which is like twice the size of British Columbia, <laughs> and only 250,000 people, 30% uh, of which are Indigenous people. And so we really wanted to tell a really positive story about work uh, uh, workforce experiences with Indigenous people across the territory. Um, and this also validated some of the learning that they took out of their secondary school educations in literacy and numeracy and embedded it in industry and workplace um, contexts. And it was a really, that was the very first project I was hired to, to do and I flew up to Darwin for. Um, and that was a really magical um, introduction to the territory and the people I worked with. Yep, it's okay. <laughs> um, the fisheries workforce and enterprise development one, um, again, kind of took this, the accredited training packages that were about, you know, the certificate for and um, aquaculture and fisheries uh, management and how to make sure that you kind of package up your you know, product and can sell it on to um, commercial purposes and all these different things. We kind of cobbled together lots of different things into a new training package specifically for people who wanted to, to do fisheries and, and um, aquaculture business on their sea country. Um, and so we took the platforms that were already existing and kind of folded them into suggested frameworks um, for people to use and then, you know, dominated the uh, Vimeo platform with um, the authored resources of harvesting cucumber and the, the oyster farm that they have growing out there, which is doing really well now. They're commercial now. So that's super cool to see that progress after, um, after you know, five years. And also biosecurity in Australia, because we're so isolated, we have really strict biosecurity um, concerns and rules. And when a virus invades um, the plant or the, the animal community here from anywhere else, there's, there's a lot of vulnerability um, to our agricultural uh, livelihoods and stuff. So biosecurity is quite like a federal kind of, you know, and they use a lot of wartime language and it's quite, you know, severe when it, when a, when a incursion happens, that's the words they use. And so working again with um, my supervisors and uh, my boss, Ruth, we developed um, in conjunction with a number of people um, uh, in the federal government and local scientists, um, ways to engage with uh, traditional owners most of whom own the 70% of the coastline that, um, you know, incursions might uh, arrive via. So um, that was a, a way to slow down the process and again, proceed with respect and, and show your relationship building. So that was another way to publicly assert um, the Indigenous Knowledge Authority into a very um, military based or kind of thinking kind of um, way of managing and issues and problems yeah because so, language really matters doesn't it you mm. know? so this language and and then there's the imagery as well it's just lots of lots of layers but yeah that's particularly 
brutal. <laughs> so the um, yeah, so the, the the analogy of the cycad uh, processing, um, and that's a very well known um, kind of process that's been used elsewhere as analogies for building relationships and creating knowledge together building um, a, a little kind of bread-like cake out of um, the cycads, which are ancient species that grow here in Northern Australia. So it was a really lovely process to go through. Cool. Um, also reinventing and renovating the unit in cultural competence and intelligence. That was a core unit for all the first year students that come to CDU, regardless of what and what uh, degree they were going into, they had to take this unit and um, when our college kind of took ownership of it during one of the very first restructures we've been through. Um, we have all these amazing senior Yolngu lecturers uh, who were very generous in su supplying us with this cultural framework for how kind of you interact with the world and the knowledge of your cultural self and how many dimensions that has. And so they developed this lovely framework for us. And then I kind of um, complemented it with some of the um, more generic academic kind of skills that went along along with, um, you know, engaging students in that kind of process so that they can take it forward into their degrees. So that was another kind of way to appropriate the, uh, the, the platform with some really great um, concepts and knowledge. Um, that, that's um, the unit that we wrote about in one of those articles that was started. Yeah. yeah. So there's some nitty gritty about what happened there. And it, there's mm. just a, a lot of when it the rubber hits the road after the design, those beautiful um, assessment conversations and how you can model this. The, so I think uh, a lot of what we talk about there is, um, yeah, so that 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 is a yeah. go-to place for, for more information on that one. Assessment, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, and that was the assessments that we um, developed, you know, kind of and, and redefined um, in, the, in the new version of the unit, which was, you know, current events at the time, with, you know, COVID um, just kind of starting to kick off, and then they you know the um, the racism and regional Australia, and then the mining industry and the impact it has on um, traditional owners in their country. So, um, getting them to identify the cultural incapability in some of those situations, but also recommend better ways to move forward in such contentious times and issues. So in the pre-practice, before I go into any of the teaching or, um, and, you know, not just in that unit, but in any of the, any of the units I am teaching in, because like Sarah, we have a lot more, um, every semester, just a lot more diverse student bodies and want to really respect their experiences of where they're coming from, but also understand that they're all going to have, um, a history of, of not so great ex educational experiences, no matter where they're from too. So um, a lot of that has obviously been impl impl influenced by a lot of, you know, old conventional patriarchal and colonialist thinking. And so just some of the thinking um, that's influenced a lot of my, um, my approaches is Unipingo's both ways, um, poor old man's passed on just recently, so to him. Um, the Cultural Interface um, by Nakata. That's a, another amazingly um, wonderful Australian based, um, he's Torres Strait Islander actually, JCU up in um, Townsville. And he's a wonderful um, theorist in education in Australia too. And that's a great way to start to look at some of the environments that we work in deciding what's most important as an instructor for me um, and to be digital territory sharing and power seeding with students, um, but also having a real openness to them and their confusion or their initial contact as my design imperative. So I try and make things as clear and as predictable and as supportive as possible in my design of the units when I teach, but also um, I've been really facing with a lot of uh, student anxiety, especially in the last few years. I'm sure that's not a not a mystery to everyone. So um, I've been really um, trying to um, embrace a lot of the stuff that comes my way as a, 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 an imperative to design differently and to adapt co continuously. Um, and then, you know, obviously a lot of students will have preferences for, for more direct instruction and I have to respect that too. So 
it's just a lot of um, adjustment. Um, and then again, also meeting students I, where I think they might be and where they can tell me where they are. So instead of having a real come to the mountain, you know, come to Jesus type uh, expectation of students meeting certain institutional standards or else, um, understanding that there is a lot of privilege in um, where we're sitting and having that um, in inform all the options that we do have to adjust our practice just a little bit to um, open the door wider. You know, I'm just one thing that immediately I think of that I'm doing currently with the um, online classes that I'm holding, um, particularly yeah. with um, the sort of diversity of international students there and their feelings about their English and so on is, mm. is I'm finding this whole recording of Zoom thing, which we do, but there's sometimes now a practice where I'm realizing I switch the recording off and go now, who's got another question and then forth will come some that actually they're holding yeah. back on because of the publicness of the recording so this is one of those sensitivities too and then choosing to you know take take mm. off um take off the, the power of that and and actually um deal with more sensitive things that actually shouldn't be shared so there's exactly. some interesting stuff that joe's sort of talked about through Indigenous knowledge about some stuff we haven't got the right to be open about in our practice, there's a boundary to it. And I'm I'm really hit that very clearly in, in some of the Zoom recordings and feeling a lot more fluent about turning it thing, the recording off and on a few times and that's okay. Definitely, um, yeah. It was, a, it was a nice thing to do with the platform I felt is to, to feel present in your intuitive judgment in the relational way you have with the students. So that, that was another potentially decolonizing practice is it okay if I hit the next slide Joe? I'm kind Thank of you. Yep. sort of second guessing I'm hoping it's okay nope. <laughs> no that's cool I only have a couple more um so again the, some of the processes that the pedagogical influences have led to is the feed forward a uh, workshopping of assessments each week I break it down into the this week we should be doing this so let's do it together in class and um I've, ever since I started doing that, especially in the first unit that I did with this, you know, there was a thousand students every semester, between 500 and a thousand every trimester. Um, you know, that really demystified what the assignment could look like. And that actually led to a huge drop in um, cases of plagiarism. And that's only anecdotal. I wish I'd evidenced that. God, it would have been so great. Um, but uh, yeah, also relating. Um, this to the degree knowledge and the and the work um, and experiences that students have all of our students have jobs now and so I really need to remind myself of that it encourages me to be a lot more cognitively supportive and not make it a big mystery for them because they only have so much cognitive load um, whereas when education was free in the 90s and everything was like there was money flowing all over the place <laughs> um, our our kind of anecdotal experiences of higher education may lead us to think that students have this lovely breezy experience, but that's not the case. Um, then I, you know, through that feed forward, I modeled a peer review. They're starting to do that now. It's week six, so students are really starting to feel more comfortable using the discussion board as a real central hub. I hate that word, but you know, locus of communication where we all share stuff and oh, that someone's doing this. I found a, a great resource, and so they're starting to be really collegial and how they're sharing um, links to things, um, but also really um, taking the concepts and asking them where they see that in their own lives and work uh, um, is really helping to embed it in a, in, a, in a motivating kind of situation for them that relates to them and their lives rather than, you know, having to um, abstract all these knowledges all the time. Um, and again, student contact and confusion is, is my design um, imperative and respecting their student realities like their their caring responsibilities the fact that some of them haven't seen their families for three or four years now um you know and they're just going to need a little bit more um cognitive signposting not uh yeah yeah so a lot less, more signposting less and less, less and less hidden curriculum thank you yeah for sure yeah, yeah. And that's yep. the beautiful public uh, oh, press book. Um, 
I also make sure that the, you know, the unit materials are, are consistent each week. I divide my recording up into 20 to 30 minute uh, chunks and uh, each you know, of those four kind of sections are always going to be about the same thing. And I, you know, share that at the beginning of semester, uh, the central communication and the discussion board and draft sharing location, uh, recorded interviews uh, as assessments. That's something that um, really is, you know, was amazing. A lot of our international students um, actually chose to do that rather than pre-record a written one um, or submit a written one. A lot of them were very happy to submit um, a, a little facey video um, of, for one of their presentation assessments. And that was actually gorgeous because you really got to see them get excited about the connections they were making. Um, publishing the students' work in this gorgeous press book that we're keeping adding to and opportunities to connect with other cohorts. Um, when I was down in Melbourne, we got some uh, connections with people in Australia and in the SIGs, but also i um, gonna go over to Ontario later this year, hopefully for a fellowship to be confirmed. Um, but yeah, gonna go and chat to those guys and share some research. So it's just great. a list of, yeah, this, the, the publications I've done on all the projects I've spoken about yeah, um, so that have had a decolonial a... impact. Yep, great um, reading list on the, those are specific to what you've spoken about. And so yeah. this will be in, in the pack. And then this is the extended reading list. So any of those additional links, those heaps of, <laughs> boom, you know, boom, exactly. Heaps of, yeah. heaps of stuff there. Yeah. Cool. Heaps of stuff for you to kind of go through. And that's, that's the reading list from my PhD. So, you know, it's obviously there's more to be added there from the last few years. Thanks. Thank you. Um, it's been great to learn from Joe as we've been collaborating. Each of us has a sort of different bent, I suppose. So um, yeah, it's been it's been a good stretch for both of us. And I think at the moment, as I mentioned, I'm sort of you know thinking about being more intentional about um, pedagogy being inclusive, being informed by this sort of um, cross cultural um, kind of thinking. Um, continuing to work with a feminist framing as well which I think I've always done but just never felt confident to claim until recently which is a whole nother story in itself but um yeah doing some interesting work on decolonizing assessment at the moment um redesigning assessments I've been given some liberties there um in my Monash role and and that's just been empowering to be able to create space in that assessment for each student from their particular um you know country background to connect their their current uh, teaching experience with their projected you know future career and and to um, embed their assessment in in the realities of their culture and, and making it clear that they can take a deep dive into what the education technology is like like a critical lens to it in their particular circumstance and showing them how it isn't universal, you know, it isn't everyone, it isn't, it's specific, the context is important, the culture is important, the timing of that is important, and how different that can be, and helping them step back from those sort of universal sort of claims. So anyway, that's um, a lot uh, about what is happening for me. And I want to teach with you now. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, that would be amazing, yeah. But um, capstone, yeah, I'm also doing a capstone unit. So yeah, that the quality of the work and the diversity of students' projects, it's just such a fantastic, I love that sort of supervisory thing. But let's let's turn to the buzz thing, ChatGPT. Oh my heavens. So um, that large language model, that ability to make you feel like there's an empathetic talker talking, answering, conversing with you, you know, it's just, there is an amazing quality to it. You know, I there is an emotional feeling you get when something comes back and it really feels <laughs> like a sort of really viable conversation. So I, I do understand the kind of wow factor that's happened and then the subsequent sort of angst about um you know will students ever write again and you know will they be de-skilled and will they be cheating all the time and you know how do we change our assessment and 21st century learning and yeah 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 that's great there's a lot of people doing some beautiful things on that what i want to know you know my my actual concern um very much from this sort of feminist perspective is actually i think the change that's happening in education is kind of 
it's nothing to me compared to what's happen, happening in, in the broader society. I think what's happening to a whole swathes of roles, workers in the creative industries, in the writing industries, the art sectors, the, the visual artists, um, it really troubles me very much the sorts of um, exploitation that's happened to get this tool to this and then the, the sources of data that it's working on. So I'm very concerned at that more macro level and I think the matter of whether or not you know we're going to adjust our assessments in higher education one way or the other is prank you know yeah good good of course but kind of not really so much where it's at so for me and and then the next spin though is you know these tools are only as good as what they train on and if we're going to be all let loose on it how can we use it you know, to, to be more inclusive and how can we point it to much more diverse material? Um, so, yeah, following on from this research into open textbooks as part of that thinking, you know, um, people who've been following the open education sorts of debates, The you know, it's a long time we've had the possibilities of open educational resources and at that same amount of time we've had trouble getting academics' time and workload to actually write those resources and that's never not been an issue so for me the sniff of being able to more quickly draft things using a tool like this does seem to offer some real potential so I really wanted to have a look at it from the perspective of overcoming some of those um, get a draft done hurdle because it's always easier to, to polish a thing and edit a thing than look at a blank page <laughs> so um, I did some experiments into that and but also from this inclusive lens, this social justice lens about representation of women's expertise, um, women of colour, people of colour, scholars of colour who we cite, you know, who we say is um, fabulous and so on, who <laughs> we should be talking about. Like um, there's a lot of policy um, ideals in, in higher education in Australia, looking at indigenizing curriculum, looking at cultural, there's different kinds of wordings on it, but there's lots of people introducing new strategies to, to look at a more global and, and a sort of respect for indigenous knowledge and um, global knowledges. So it's kind of worded in different ways in different locations. So there's definitely an interest to try and um, you know, I've been exper experimenting with it very quickly to see if we can get some case studies. I, I just know female business leaders and entrepreneurs from around the world, we just don't see very much of that in many of the texts. That was something that was quite clear from that national study. So that was the first thing I had a bit of a crack at. And yeah, I've had some super duper experience, infuriating experiences with just the worst gender stereotyping in images with some of these tools. So, you know, that's been really rubbing me up the wrong way. So um, took some experiments to uh, my workplace at RMIT in equity and inclusion. I've been working with the fab librarians there around its decolonization potential. I've run some sessions like this, got some really interesting feedback and we at RMIT are in a, a fantastic position of having Indigenous librarians for each of our colleges. So that is a sort of great um, starting point, you know, to have like some support um, and people who are positioned well um, there. So um, I think I'm actually not going to talk about this because I'm going to run out of time, Joe. but um, Joe and I did a kind of what are we reading about situ situation, which I'm going to have to zoom over and maybe we'll touch base if there's questions. But at the moment, yeah, lots of stuff on Twitter about about this, but um, what I'm really focused on is I'm really interested in the fight back tools, in the resistance that's happening. So I just want to draw your attention to some of these big things. This is from um, a sort of non, an EU non-commercial alternative that is growing um, some actual tools to prevent artists having their work mimicked. Um, coming out of different places, Miss Journey and various tools that are really working at this gender problem and providing alternative spaces where you can definitely be assured of a female professional image, which should be a blessed change from the overwhelming tsunami of soft porn female images that I'm really starting to get very cranky about in the social media at the moment. 
Um, Joe's got some beautiful comments then, but you know what? This top one um, from Dr. Black Deer, we will not two-day workshop our way out of systemic oppression is just a delightful, um, beautiful way um, kind of reflecting what I started off with is this is a, a long commitment and not a box ticking two-day workshop. Um, are you okay if I just move jokers of time? Yeah, we might come back to beautiful things there. Um, yep. So what I learned from the early experiments is that chat GPT at the moment, because it's locked down in particular versions, it doesn't actually learn. So if you ask it to just please not send me some horrible sexist content the first time. The third time, you're going to have to ask it again. It, it doesn't yet learn. So <laughs> it's a bit annoying in that way, to say the least. Um, and uncritical questions get you some really uncritical answers. So my big takeaway is to ask it better questions. And this is stuff as academics we should be good at, right? We spend a lot of time thinking about um you know, what, it, what What are we asking about, you know? Uh, so, yeah. So, basically, your chat GPT is reinforcing mainstream bias about what is popular or good. So, you just have to have, you just have to, you know, you have to be really blunt about what you ask it. So, if you ask for good examples, you're going to get, so if you say, you know, what are the top three X, you're going to get, what that means is what's popular on the internet may or may not be good. You know, and if you don't ask explicitly for gender balance, you're going to get guys. And if you don't ask for racial balance, you're going to get mostly white US or UK, mostly guys. So it's kind of a bit blunt at the moment to say this, but honestly, um, I've just been a little bit um, flummoxed at how much this isn't really talked about uh, because people are just so seduced by the speed and so seduced by the ease. And I know that we have pressures, but allowing the speed seduction is just, yeah, is just really, really challenging. So um, <laughs> a couple of these screenshots for you. So just starting off with female science leaders, it's something at RMIT, we're really doing work on representation there. Um, so I just asked it to write us two case studies of female science leaders from any part of the world except the USA or the UK and 500 words. And in very short order, I had a couple of great cases, um, starting off with the directing of the Indian Space Research Organization. And I just was like, I have to say, every time I read about women doing amazing things, often in India, I just go, why do we never hear, you know, why do we never hear this story? So anyway, um, they, they were, they were good and they could, you could go back and verify that, you know, having got this sort of information, you can, you can then go backwards and do some, some searching. Um, but they were incredibly repetitive. So they use almost the same sentences. Um, and there was a lot of gendered stuff in those sentences too. So female leaders are talked about, you know, um, they talk about how they, you know, brought the company together and increased, you know, the sort of acceptance of this and, you know, had a focus on the environment or something like that. So there's, there's, there's some, yeah, th there was some interesting repetitive stuff in there. So it was a starting point, but it, it definitely wasn't an end point. So possibly useful. Um, RMIT is a Vietnamese campus. I was really interested to consider the how is it crawling over different languages in the web? So technically it can, it is supposed to work in lots of different languages, but, but anecdotally and then subsequently through these experiments and then talking with my students about it, um, it is much poorer, much, much poorer and much, much more generic in what it says um, when it's trying to crawl um, across definitely these Vietnamese examples. I asked um, who are the top three female entrepreneurs in Vietnam and what are they famous for? And then out it came. And because of course, I'm not a native speaker and I can't interpret those particular names, um, I knew I would need to fact check this. So the first thing when I discussed it with my students from Manash, one out of the three is in fact a man. <laughs> so <laughs> we are at the two out of three, <laughs> ain't bad sort of a case. 
but um you know it it did quickly kind of give you a short list that you could you could go and do some work on so um it was definitely worth um helpful if you're doing this kind of work of trying to locate more culturally inclusive examples for whatever audience that you have so um definitely um i found i found that useful but then i had to kind of start thinking about how else i could fact check um so i then went and asked it to find me a url of a good article written in english about this person and it did actually bring me back through something so um while I'd love to just you know ask my students all the time they're busy too so you know but we could definitely you know do do some sort of um small funded very small internal grant funding and pay some students to do some editing of of this kind of work which I think actually would be pretty pretty neat on a lot of levels potentially um, particularly in like an assessment like Joe's where you're writing a, a really um, current report on a sort of cultural area that um, there's an option to, to publish so you know we can combine these techniques I suppose is what is what I'm saying um, yeah so um, yeah these kind of fact checkings are trying to overcome you know my English dependency basically in in a in a multilingual world and yeah I was asking them about are there articles written in the Vietnamese media about these people as well as another strategy to kind of help it to kind of fact check a little bit and it did name some of those outlets which again I would ha you would be relying on uh, an, a local speaker to actually verify that so it's by far from perfect um, but an interesting experiment um, nevertheless so where I think we really had a lot more traction and a lot more um, a sort of wow factor when I presented this with the librarians at RMIT was um, so within our First Nations sort of teaching and learning guide there's a recommendation to look at the Black Words website and that is a particular curated um, hub for um, for work that is solely um, Indigenous authored. Now, what you can then do is ask ChatGPT to read that website and pull out of it things that are relevant to your curriculum. So in the case, I was doing a presentation with business and law um, staff. And so I, I asked it to make a list of authors and their written works, which are about business topics. Now, that's quite interesting what uh, what came back. It said, I apologize, but after reviewing the website, I did not find any authors or written work specifically about business topics. It told me that the website is an online database that focuses on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander writers and storytelling. And it gave me more information about those genres. And so, you know, do you want to ask me any more questions? And indeed I did. I went back a third time. So I'm really refining prompts is, is a thing. So I asked it to read the website and make a list of authors and their stories that mention characters who own businesses or are lawyers. Now, boom, here comes a curated list of things that you could then go of all the squillion things in that database here's five that might be a starting point if that's your interest so I had to understand that in this platform populated with indigenous knowledge the use of stories and storytelling is 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 um, legitimate and preferred and my kind of western sciencey girl case study terminology cut no mustard there and in fact you know I needed to ask it a better question as well so I got a lot out of that little example um, not least of which there was a, a useful way to um, to navigate uh, a, a big a big website so um, in the discussion with the colleagues at RMIT this kind of um, pointing chat GPT at a more acknowledged and respected information source was um, highly much more highly regarded than a kind of um, pointing it at the web and fact checking afterwards so it led us to an interesting discussion on what kind of work might be happening um, within libraries within different colleges within different institutions and how we could get going some other indigenous repositories because I know for example if you're doing land management or sea management there's some amazing indigenous rangers in Australia who are out on TikTok just you know just like huge 
it's great stuff like that would be unreal to have but again you're going to have to sift through stuff so it would be interesting to see how successful this would be get diving into TikTok and pulling things out too I, I haven't gone that far because I, I haven't got an account with TikTok and I'm a bit afraid if I start there I might not come out but um, what other repositories of um, material that's that has you know significant Indigenous authorship maybe that is a place where we could actually collectively put in some um, some effort. So I'm, I'm keen to kind of know, particularly on a discipline by discipline level, where there might be some pockets of activity. That would be really cool. That would be, think, um, that would be a relationally, re, you know, kind of relevant. So if you knew who was doing that kind of work, then you could ask. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, so that 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 was the sort of end point for, for those reflections. And so um, we come up with some, through that session, some, you know, options of things that people can do, um, go to Black Words, check it out, give it a whirl. There's a Zotero group called Cider Blackfella that's run by the University of Melbourne. I don't know if in other places there's similar organisations, but really I'm going to stop sharing because I want to, um, get some feedback and um, see if anyone has uh, some input into all of that.